welcome. I'd like to introduce John Labby. John is the owner of JEM Performance Consultant, where he helps people and businesses improve skills and increase job satisfaction. John is a member of Toastmasters Plus and Toastmasters on Purpose, which both meet in Palatine, Illinois. He presently is serving as the Northwest Division Governor. Just as we all have habits that we might like to change, organizations can have bad habits too. In this workshop, John will introduce us to the idea of keystone habits, and together we will explore ways to introduce powerful new habits to our Toastmasters Club. Please help me welcome John Clapp. How are we doing on handouts? I have a, a handout for everybody, and I want to make sure that everybody has one because there are some notes to be taken. Can I get an assistant to jump up and help me here really quickly? Thank you very much. So who here has ever worked someplace where the way we do things here seemed counterproductive, maybe even a little dumb. I found the 17 people in the world who have ever worked in such an organization. Is that it? My guess is most of us have. As you heard in the introduction, people have habits. Some are good habits. That habit that gets you up in the morning and puts a good breakfast into you before you start your work day, the habit to brush your teeth regularly, all of those things, those are good habits. There are some that maybe we'd like to change. The one that keeps you in bed until nine on a Saturday when you ought to be mowing the lawn maybe, I don't know. And organizations are the same. Good habits, bad habits. Our purpose, is to come to an understanding of a particular type of habit called the keystone habit. And the way keystone habits work in organizations. We're all leaders in Toastmasters clubs. Is there anyone here from a perfect club? <laughs> So we all can bring something home to improve our club. Our purpose is to consider together how we can identify organizational habits that might be useful to our clubs. So to begin, we first need to learn what's a habit. When most people think of a habit, they think of, at 3 in the afternoon, I get a donut. <laughs> or any time somebody asks me a question, I do this. Right? Or I smoke cigarettes. Or I have a habit of skipping breakfast. Whatever. We think of the thing we do or don't do as the habit. But in fact, if you were to be able to see what was going on in your brain, you would see that a habit actually has three parts. Before that thing you do, and I'm not going to sing the song, before that thing you do that you think of as the habit, before that happens, there's a cue. C-U-E. Something cues the habit. It might be that it's 3 in the afternoon and it's time to go get a jelly donut. Or it might be that your alarm clock went off and it's time to go get in the shower. Something triggers the habit. 
Now, sometimes those triggers are a little hard to identify, particularly with really long, persevering habits that you've had for years and years and years. It may be tough to recognize what the cue is, but there is one. Fortunately, in organizations, they're pretty easy to spot. So the second part of a habit is the routine. That's the part that you already know about. It's the eating the jelly donut, smoking the cigarette, taking the shower. When you take a shower, close the shower door, pull the curtains, whatever, water's on. If you close your eyes, I bet you can picture your first move. Reach for the soap, reach for the shampoo, whatever it is, right? It's always the same. The habit saves you time, saves you mental energy. So that's not a bad thing. And habits and organizations save us time and energy as well. So we have a cue, and we have the routine, and that's the thing that you do. The reason that habits exist, though, is the third part, and that's the reward. So I have my three in the afternoon jelly donut. What might be my reward? Well, there's certainly the immediate sugar rush. There's the fun that I have, picking the sugar out of my beard. <laughs> but maybe it's none of that. Maybe it's that I just needed to get up out of my desk and get the exercise that it took me to get to where I could get my jelly donut. Or maybe it's that when I go to get my jelly donut in the afternoon, I get a chance to stop by Bill's desk and check on the Cubs. Yeah. Right? Right. It could be any of those things. Your reward. It's not necessarily the jelly donut. So we have a cue, a routine, and a reward. And what happens in the brain is you get a big spike of activity when the cue comes off. Three o'clock, big spike. During the routine, your brain's pretty quiet. It knows what you're doing, and it knows how to do it. It knows how to eat that jelly donut. And then when you get the reward, you get another big spike of mental activity. <coughs> Crazy thing is, that the shape of that, the brain waves during the reward look just like the shape of the brain waves at the cue once the habit is fully established. And the, what that does is it creates a craving. The brain gets this image, sort of been copied and pasted from the reward into the cue period. And as soon as that cue goes off, the brain's feeling the reward already. And that's making you go after the jelly donut. Or at least me. <laughs> All right, let's switch to organizations. Is that part pretty square? Mm -hmm. Cue, routine, reward. 1987, a guy by the name of Paul O'Neill was hired to take over as CEO of the Aluminum Company of America. You may know them as Alcoa. Mm -hmm. They're a small business. They make every Coke can in the world. <laughs> and a few other things made out of aluminum. In 1987, Alcoa was in trouble. So they brought in an outsider, Paul O'Neill, and at the traditional introduction meeting, to investors and stock analysts, Paul O'Neill stood up and he didn't say, I'm going to raise profits by 12% in the third quarter. He said, we're going to become the safest company in the world. Alcoa works with molten metal in their factories. We are going to become the safest company in the world. Scared the bejabbers out of every analyst in the room. 
They didn't know what hit them. But here's what he did. Paul O'Neill knew from his years working in the federal government, in positions where he was charged with reducing waste, he knew that organizations develop habits. And he knew that not all of those habits contributed well to profit. He also knew that coming into Alcoa, he needed to introduce something that would begin to change the way things work at Alcoa. And he decided to set a goal of zero injuries. Now, here's why. Everybody likes safety. And the employees and the labor unions like safety. Management likes safety, or at least like the idea of re reduced injuries and lost time, and lost profitability. So folks mostly got behind it. <coughs> and fairly early on, they got results. O'Neill sees a report that says injuries, time off, you know, lost time due to injuries is, has been reduced. Immediately, out goes a memo to everybody in the company, congratulations, we're making progress. We should be proud not because we met goals, but because we're saving lives. People liked hearing that. Now, to fix safety, to improve safety in a manufacturing organization, it'll do a lot of different things. Lots of things have to change in order for safety to change. See where we're going? Lots of different things had to change for safety to change. For example, this is 1987, not a whole lot of internet going on. But they did have computer connectivity between offices. O'Neill set up an email program designed to carry safety reports. Pretty soon, people started using that same system to send other information to colleagues in other offices. Brazil says to New York, there's a spot shortage of X raw material over here. You're going to need to order over here. Pretty soon, Alcoa was starting to get the jump on their competition because they were sharing information through the safety email system. Here's, what, here's the way things worked at Alcoa to fix safety. Here's what the habit was. A worker gets injured. That's the cue. The routine worked like this. The group president of the, where the accident occurred was required to file a report with the CEO, Paul O'Neill, within 24 hours. But not only with the information that there was an accident, but with a plan to ensure that no similar accidents would ever happen again. So imagine what would have had to go on before in order for somebody to be able to come up with a plan and transmit it within 24 hours. Lots of other meetings, lots of thinking, lots of planning. That one goal, that one little habit, the routine of ensuring that the CEO knew about every injury within 24 hours and that there was a plan in place meant that all sorts of other routines had to have been put in place as well. So that one habit is the keystone habit. That habit created a 
I'll say offered, because I want to let you know that this is where you can fill in the blank. This Keystone Habit offered all wins. So not long after the institution of the habit, some of the safety numbers started to improve. And you'd better believe that O'Neill was promoting and advertising and celebrating those small wins. Next. We talked about how in order to meet that responsibility of filing a report with a plan within 24 hours, lots of other things had to happen. That one keystone habit allowed, is that the word I used? Helped other habits flourish. And often what happens is that they create new structures, new groups that meet periodically to review data. The email system that O'Neill put in place to transmit information about, about safety and injuries and plans and so on. So the Keystone habit created small wins and it set up A, uh, it, was sort of, it became sort of like a petri dish for other habits that were also beneficial to the organization. And then finally, imagine what's going on in the minds of people who are seeing all this change. There's things going on here, things going on there. At one point, Paul O'Neill said to every employee in the company, if you see something that needs to change, call me. Here's my number. And people did. But not to talk about safety necessarily, to talk about other ideas. Somebody had an idea that allowed them to paint their, the aluminum siding in a manufacturing plant half as expensively as before. They saved zillions of dollars off one suggestion that came to one guy who passed it on because the culture had begun to shift due to that one keystone habit. So keystone habits establish cultures where change is valued. Okay, do we have the idea of how keystone habits work? and a sense of what they look like. Now, let's switch from talking about Alcoa and big organizations to talking about our Toastmasters clubs. What are some of the habits that already exist in your clubs? Reading the statement, mission statement, everyone. There you go. There you go. The practice of reading the Toastmasters Club mission statement at the beginning of your meeting. That's a habit. How about another? Trying to fill roles. Filling roles. Oh, isn't that a good one? <laughs> Every club has sort of an ideal plan for filling roles, right? And then there's what happens. <laughs> but you do start with a routine. You do have a routine. In my home club, when I joined five years ago, the practice was that the VP of Ed created a spreadsheet that showed who would be doing exactly what for the next three months. And he decided, by the way, when you were going to speak, and when you were going to be Toastmaster, and when you were going to be the arm counter. And by the way, there, there was always the possibility that bias would enter into that because there was this one guy we did not ever want to be doing table tops. <laughs> he was a beast. <laughs> anyway, that's the habit. Another. Um, our longest running, sorry, our longest running Toastmasters member has been involved with us for 16 years and has a sign-in book. 
that he's been carrying into every meeting for the last 16 years. So we have the names, addresses, employers, and phone numbers of everyone who has visited us for those 16 years. <laughs> that helps a lot when it comes to recruitment. Oh, I would imagine it does. I would imagine it does. Now, do you see that as being a club habit or his personal habit? I think it's a personal habit that's bled over into the club. Okay. Because we know that should he ever retire someday, that 16 year long address book will continue to be brought to every meeting. It, there's just too much institution there to lose. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Some others. A couple of others. Because we are going to be talking about organizational, we're going to be talking about club habits for the rest of our time together. <laughs> yes, back there. Yes, we send out a flyer to everyone, all the employees, but very few show up as guests. Okay. And, and that's a habit and a result. Do you do that mailing regularly? Yes. So first of every quarter or something like that? Well, we have our meetings bi-weekly, and so we send it out to a uh, day before the meeting. Okay. All right. That's good. That's definitely a habit. It's something that's happening with a particular cue. And the reward would be what? The reward would be lots of guests show up. <laughs> All right. Instead, we still have to personally invite guests. Okay. So here's my question. When you don't get guests, why do you continue the habit? <laughs> and and, and I, I say that not to pick on you, because trust me, there are lots of clubs that have habits like that. Is my watch off? That it's only it's five to six, correct? And we have it until six twenty. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I just wanted to be sure about my timing. Yes. I know the habit. Yes. So. That's one of my habits, by the way, <laughs> is using so to buy time <laughs> or rolling up my sleeves. <clears throat> Here's the question. If you're doing something as club on a very routine basis and the reward you think would be more members or at least more guests. I contend that that's not the actual reward. Because the thing is, the reward happens every time. Otherwise, the habit won't continue. The reward is probably the satisfaction that the VP of PR or whoever does that mailing gets for getting it done. That would be my guess. I'm not sure that we can ever think of getting lots of guests as the habit that drives, or rather as the reward that drives a habit, unless you happen to get guests at practically every meeting. I'm not so sure that that, that happens for everybody. All right. We now have a sense of the kinds of practices that are routine in your clubs, what I would like to ask you to do is to kind of gather around into groups of six or seven or eight or thereabouts and brainstorm one new habit to, that you think, if it were introduced into a club, might act as a keystone habit. What might you do? And, and this is something I'm going to suggest that we're looking for habits that would apply anywhere, not just to a particularly struggling club, pretty much anywhere. They may, what, we, what, we're, what we're going to find is there may be some habits which really good clubs already maintain that could be a keystone habit because they have those elements of encouraging other habits to form because you need other habits in order to carry out that one keystone habit, right? 
they have the characteristic of producing small winds. So that's what we're looking for. So please, if you would, gather up five, six, seven, eight at a crack, and let's figure in five minutes, I would like each group to have one habit to suggest. Just kind of gather around and chat. I'm really afraid that I had talked so long that we are out of trouble. Well, we don't we don't always get 22 to show up. So. <laughs> That's the other key. So. <laughs> Let me tell you something that I am always interested in our club that never existed before, or after the, as a habit, we call it a habit. It's going to become our, our, our uh, specialty uh, occasion speech that we're going to give. And it's called the Outstanding Postmasters of the Year. And the real thing. Yeah. And so basically it's like having a criteria. And then just every year the executive committee talks about it and comes up with it. That's a that's a reward. And, and the reward that is not only enhances the appreciation that individually, which of course does, you know, honoring individually, but I really think that it has a culture and a club in saying that anybody can become the outstanding culture for that club. That's something that I'm doing. When you set the criteria, you can incorporate some of these competencies, habits that drive progress. That is, yes. Someone called it due to get a gift for me, so I can call it. Doesn't mean it's going to be automatic. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. It's a little bit of a change. 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 It's getting kind of crazy where like it's hard to even get to know those outsiders through the meetings because there's so many of them. Right, exactly. Versus initially when we had outsiders and insiders, it was easy for us to work each one of them because it would be like one and you get to know that one. How are we doing? Is everybody on the verge of discovery?
Get your attention back again. What do you have for us? Give us some keystone habits, folks. What do you have? What do you think might work? Who's got one? Right here. He said to create, he's not putting you on the spot because it sounded so good. He said to create something contagious in the environment, in the club, create something. Contagious. Something contagious, and what might that look like? Successes that you've uh, accomplished. Can you speak up? Successes that you've accomplished, uh, leading by example, uh, creating a contagious atmosphere that people will just buy into and let their guard down and Okay. Increase. And how could that be a habit or a routine that the club follows on a regular basis? What might create that? Consistency. All right, some form of consistency. Let's let's hang on to that over here. Giving a reward. Uh, I'm sorry. Giving a award, a ribbon, or something for those. For. Their okay, certainly a a ribbon, some kind of recognition, can work as a reward. What kind of routine might help foster other? good club habits. Yes, back here. What did your group come up with? Um, well, I was just thinking of that. You could add as, a, as an agenda item so that it's consistently done. Every to week. celebrate. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I have one for you that I was just reminded of. Relatively new club keeps their <coughs> CC and CL progress charts posted on easels in their meeting room. And whenever, at the end of every meeting, everyone who gives a speech is given a gold star to put onto the progress chart. Seems a little childish, maybe, you know, because it's the gold star and all that. But it's neat. It works. And what kinds of things do you suppose that engenders? Progress. Progress, it creates that value, that we value progress. Right? In order for that to happen, other things had to work as well. Sergeant at Arms had to source out some gold stars. Somebody has to manage the charts. So that, that has some possibility. Some others. What else what, what did you come up with back here? Um, we suggested uh, building a more personal, personable community. In making a community in, within our organization through maybe social media, okay. such as Facebook. What might you do on a very regular basis that would contribute to that? Um, I, I said, you know, create some objectives of what you want to put on social media, whether it be the videos from the Toastmasters website, um, if you videotape one of the speakers, you know, giving them a shout out on it, um, I don't know, things like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other ideas over here? Yes. To the lady here. Oh, there were two of us that raised our hands. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I, you. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, I'm the vice president of marketing and PR for 3559, and my background is in workforce development. Something that we saw there was that if you assign a mentor to somebody who's new to the community service, they don't really know if they want to be there, they're nervous. If you assign someone, it is their job to be, hi, I will be your guide through the organization. I will walk you through each step. 
Come and talk to, come and talk to membership. Come, come and talk to education. Come and give your first speech. And it's that same person whose job it is to guide them, they're much more likely to stick around, and it is much more likely for the mentor to get more involved in the organization as well. So I, this is something I think that that's great. Regularly. So the habit then is, the minute you get a brand new member, somebody starts to work with that person as a, on a mentorship basis. Absolutely correct, I, or, or terrific, I'm sorry. I like that. And for, for some of the reasons that you said, that it would get the other men, that get the mentor active and committed, et cetera. Good, yes. We, we do something similar to that with new members or new guests, is to pair them up with an existing member and sit with them and explain the flow of the meeting, how it works, what Toastmasters is about, and then follow up with them at the end. Uh, we ask them, you know, what did they think of the meeting? But we give them some handouts to take away as well so they can kind of recap what they experienced and read through it. But we find that pairing an, uh, an existing member with a new guest greatly helps with the retention rate. That does sound like a good idea. So the habit is every time you have a guest, this is how we respond, right? right? Mm -hmm. I think that works. I think that works. <laughs> what other groups came up with something interesting? Yes? Well, I mean, kind of to that point, you know, when you start a group, you kind of, everyone goes around the table and introduces themselves. But our idea was to kind of use the tabletop person comes up with a specific idea, like tell us something like what your favorite, what, you know, what are your, what you did this week. You know, so, so you learn more about the people and like their favorite hobbies are and things like that. So each time having a different icebreaker. Okay. So, and, and is this something then that, that makes certain that everyone speaks at every meeting? Yes, and you get to know the other people in the meeting. Okay, okay. I like that. Which was? For reminding people that there is a coming Toastmaster meeting. Just like the, from a doctor's office, there's a machine uh, coming on your phone. Right. And tells you you have an appointment with such and such doctor at such and such time. So this way, it would remind them of the Toastmaster meeting. And so they don't forget and that it will be the attendance of the you know, meeting. So the habit would be routinely sending out reminders using some kind of automated setup in some way? Right. I think that could be interesting. Any others? Yes, ma'am. Make a list of the members and their goals, what they want to achieve from Toastmasters, and how they can, what help they want. Okay, and how would you make that into a habit? You would, the VP of Education would monitor the goals being achieved. Okay, so perhaps at the end of each meeting, the VP of Ed does something to track progress against goals, is that it? Or have that chart with the star. Okay. Any other ideas? Yes, right here. Okay, I didn't bring this up, but this is an idea. We just started this year to have a CL evaluator. And what that is that everybody who's going to be doing a meeting role, there's one person who will do their the evaluations of the person doing the meeting role. It's all like this. And what that does, I see, first of all, there's a routine every year, every week it's gonna happen, is that um, that it brings to mind to everybody to bring their CL manual, that you get credit for this because it's so easy to forget that that even exists. It's just the speeches and the meeting, and you can get credit and how important that is. I think that's terrific. Yeah. For those who didn't quite hear it, yeah. let me repeat. Yeah. The idea yeah. is that every meeting has several functions, right? Timer, Toastmaster, etc. They add a new function. CL evaluator. That person is on the agenda for every meeting. I gather this is the person who yes. fills out yes, the right. CL books for everyone who has a meeting role. And it serves to do two or three things. 
It reminds people to bring their CL books because they see that function on the agenda and they know that, they're, that they have to fill that role from time to time. So it creates the habit of people bringing their CL books and we all know that that's a habit that lots of us could use. <laughs> And I suspect that it creates a sense in the club that that competent leadership development is really important. I like that. That really has all of the elements of a keystone habit. I really like that. How are we doing on time? We're about six or seven minutes. All right. Thoughts, comments, tomatoes. I got one. <laughs> We have a unique function at Fox Valley. We have what we call a bloviate award, where we have an experienced Toastmaster who seems to be carrying on and on, and we're trying to get him to get to the point a little bit. Okay, then. I'll take the point. <laughs> they have a bloviator award. Yes, sir. If there's one takeaway you want us, all of us, to take away today, what would you say to us? Look at your clubs in terms of the regular practices. Look at those practices and try to assess if they are helpful or not. It's a little bit like my jelly donut habit. I know it's not helpful. I should fix that. In one of my clubs, we have what I think is a very good habit. We require a very brief introduction of everyone in the room at the start of every meeting. Gets everyone speaking, unwraps the cobwebs, which is necessary because we meet at 7.15 on Monday morning. <laughs> but I look at that and there are times when I think we ought to tweak this. I just, it's, it's, it's a good thing and yet I think we can tweak it. We, are, have, we have fallen into a habit of filling our agenda roles 20 minutes before the meeting starts, 10 minutes before the meeting starts. That's not a good habit. That's not a good practice. We need to fix that. So look at your clubs as a grouping of practices and do your club a favor. Assess those practices and try to identify the ones that might not be helping the club achieve its goals as effectively and as efficiently as you'd like. Other thoughts? Questions, comments, and again, no tomatoes, please. Yes? How long does it take your club to do the introductions? We have seven members, so it does to, doesn't take very long. <laughs> we have had more in the past, and when there are 20 members in the room, it can run close to 10 minutes. So to our meeting, it's a community club, and we built that into our into our agenda time. Yes. What are the top three most successful practices you know of for clubs? Wow. The top three most <laughs> successful practices that I know of for a club. I'm not an expert on Toastmasters. I've just kind of hung around long enough to do this now and again. <laughs> Here's what I would like to suggest. Do you all participate in the District 30 LinkedIn group? Yeah. Let's start a discussion there and, and share some of those practices. And if somebody else will take the responsibility for starting that group, <laughs> I promise to contribute, but I'm leaving from Maine at 6 in the morning, so I won't be able to start it for a couple of days, but if somebody else will start it, I will jump in as soon as I'm within range of Wi-Fi. 
Thank you, sir. I think I can give you one because I, I look at three different clubs when I look for a club, and our club starts on time, ends on time. They are literally watching that second hand, hit the hour, the bang we start, and the same way when we end it. It was so nice to be someplace where, where they're respectful of your time. You know, that is a good one. And one of the clubs that I worked with last year does that precisely. They have somebody staring at a cell phone say, yes, hit the gavel. It's 12 o'clock. It's a corporate club. They have only so much time. And they close their meetings precisely on time as well. That is definitely one of those better practices. Any others? I got one. Yes, sir. Something that kills the club, never cancel a meeting. Yes, indeed. Canceling a meeting is a very bad practice. People go there and spend their time, make sure that their time is worthwhile, otherwise you're telling them your time's not really right. that important. Always have a meeting. Always have a meeting. You have been a great audience. I hope that we've all learned a little something and brought, have, have picked up something we can take back to our clubs. I know I have after vacation. Thank you very much. <laughs>